From the Conference Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Saturday afternoon session of the 191st Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, with speakers selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session is provided by a multicultural choir from Stakes in Northern Utah. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. Brothers and sisters, we welcome you to the Saturday afternoon session of the 191st Semiannual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson, who presides at this conference, has asked me to conduct this session. We extend our greetings to all who are in attendance or who participate by means of television, radio, or the internet. The music for this session will be provided by a multicultural choir from Stakes in Northern Utah, under the direction of Jamie Kalama Wood with Linda Margots at the organ. As we mentioned this morning, we have reduced the size of the choir in order to allow for social distancing. This practice was also followed during rehearsals. All participating this afternoon have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19 and were recently tested to ensure they are not infected with the virus. The choir will open this meeting by singing, Hark All Ye Nations. The invocation will then be offered by Elder William K. Jackson, of the 70.
Our beloved Father in heaven, at the start of this session of conference, we express our gratitude to Thee for the matchless life of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, for His promises kept, His mission accomplished, for the plan of happiness and His infinite atonement. We thank Thee for the restoration of the gospel and for prophets, seers, and revelators, and ask Thee to bless them abundantly. Father, we ask Thee to be with those in and out of the Church who seek a blessing at Thy hand this day. Please be with our missionary forces throughout the world, that they might be protected and directed, and that we, their teammates, may be inspired to find ways to assist them in the work of the gathering. Father, we ask Thee to bless us with the Holy Ghost this afternoon, that we may be taught from on high, that we may receive answers to our inspired questions and be edified together that we may know the things that we should do. Heavenly Father, we love Thee, and we express our gratitude for Thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. President Henry B. Eyring will now present the General Authorities, Area 70s, and general officers of the church for sustaining vote. Brothers and sisters, as announced, I will now present the general authorities, area 70s, and general officers of the church for your sustaining vote. Please express your vote in the usual way wherever you may be. If there are those who oppose any of the proposals, we ask that you contact your stake president. It is proposed that we sustain Russell Marion Nelson as prophet, seer, and revelator, and president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Dallin Harris Oaks as first counselor in the First Presidency, and Henry Benyon Eyring as second counselor in the First Presidency. Those in favor may manifest it. Those opposed, if any, may manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain Dallin H. Oaks as president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and M. Russell Ballard as acting president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Those in favor, please signify. Any opposed may manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain the following as the members of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, M. Russell Ballard, Jeffrey R. Holland, Dieter F. Uchtdorf, David A. Bednar, Quentin L. Cook, D. Todd Christofferson, Neil L. Anderson, Ronald A. Rasband, Gary E. Stevenson, Dale G. Rendlin, Garrett W. Gong, 
and Ulysses Suarez. Those in favor, please manifest it. Any opposed may so indicate. It is proposed that we sustain the counselors in the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as prophets, seers, and revelators. All in favor, please manifest it. Contrary, if there be any by the same sign. We have released Elders J. Devon Cornish, Timothy J. Dykes, David F. Evans, Robert C. Gay, James B. Martino, and Terence M. Vinson as General Authority 70s and grant them emeritus status. Those who wish to express gratitude to these brethren and their families for their dedicated service may do so by the uplifted hand. We note that Elder Dean M. Davies, who passed away on August 31, 2021, would have been released as a General Authority 70 this conference. We extend to Sister Darla Davies and to the family our heartfelt condolences and appreciation for Elder Davies' tireless service. We also note with appreciation the Area 70s who have completed their service during this past year. Those who wish to join in expressing gratitude to these brethren for their excellent service may manifest it. It is proposed that we sustain the other general authorities Area 70s, including two new Area 70s announced earlier this week in newsroom.churchofjesuschrist.org, and the general officers as presently constituted. All in favor, please manifest it. Those opposed, if any, thank you for your continued faith and prayers in behalf of the leaders of the Church. The choir will now favor us with Consider the Lilies. After the singing, we will be pleased to hear from Elder David A. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elder Cyril Schmeil of the Seventy and Sister Susan H. Porter, who serves as the first counselor in the primary general presidency. Elder Eric W. Kopischka of the 70 will then address us. Both Elder Schmeil and Elder Kopischka recorded their messages previously from their assigned areas due to travel restrictions imposed by COVID-19.
I pray that the Holy Ghost will enlighten and edify all of us as we consider together the marvelous work of salvation and exaltation in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Approximately three years after the first vision, on the night of September 21, 1823, young Joseph Smith was praying to receive a remission of his sins and to know of his state and standing before God. A personage appeared at his bedside, called Joseph by name, and declared he was a messenger sent from the presence of God and that his name was Moroni. He explained that God had a work for Joseph to do and then instructed him about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Significantly, the Book of Mormon was one of the first topics addressed in Moroni's message. <clears throat> the Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ and the great tool of conversion in the latter days. Our purpose in sharing the gospel is to invite all to come unto Jesus Christ, receive the blessings of the restored gospel, and endure to the end through faith in the Savior, helping individuals to experience the mighty change of heart and bind themselves to the Lord through sacred covenants and ordinances are the fundamental objectives of preaching the gospel. Moroni's introduction of the Book of Mormon to Joseph Smith initiated the work of salvation and exaltation for individuals on this side of the veil in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Continuing his instruction to Joseph, Moroni next quoted from the book of Malachi in the Old Testament with a little variation in the language used in the King James Version. Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. Our purpose in building temples is to make available the holy places wherein the sacred covenants and ordinances necessary for the salvation and exaltation of the human family can be administered for both the living and the dead. Moroni's instruction to Joseph Smith about the vital role of Elijah and priesthood authority expanded the work of salvation and exaltation on this side of the veil and initiated in our dispensation the work for the dead on the other side of the veil. In summary, Moroni's teachings in September of 1823 about the Book of Mormon and the mission of Elijah established the doctrinal foundation for the work of salvation and exaltation on both sides of the veil. The lessons Joseph Smith learned from Moroni influenced every aspect of his ministry. For example, at a solemn assembly held in the Kirtland Temple on April 6, 1837, the prophet taught, quote, after all that has been said, the greatest and most important duty is to preach the gospel." Close quote. Almost precisely seven years later, on April 7, 1844, Joseph Smith delivered a sermon known today as the King Follett Discourse. He declared in that address, quote, "...the greatest responsibility in this world that God has laid upon us is to seek after our dead." Close quote. But how can preaching the gospel and seeking after our dead both be the single greatest duty and responsibility God has placed upon us? I believe the Prophet Joseph Smith was emphasizing in both statements the fundamental truth that covenants entered into through authoritative priesthood ordinances can bind us to the Lord Jesus Christ and are the essential core of the work of salvation and exaltation on both sides of the veil. 
Missionary and temple and family history work are complementary and interrelated aspects of one great work that focuses upon the sacred covenants and ordinances that enable us to receive the power of godliness in our lives and ultimately return to the presence of Heavenly Father. Thus, the two statements by the prophet that initially may appear contradictory, in fact, highlight the focal point of this great Latter-day work. The Savior said, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Beloved brothers and sisters, we take the Savior's yoke upon us as we learn about, worthily receive, and honor sacred covenants and ordinances. We are bound securely to and with the Savior as we faithfully remember and do our best to live in accordance with the obligations we have accepted. And that bond with Him is the source of spiritual strength in every season of our lives. I invite you to consider the blessings promised to covenant-keeping disciples of Jesus Christ. For example, Nephi beheld the Church of the Lamb of God in the latter days, and its numbers were few. The saints of God were also upon all the face of the earth, and their dominions were small. He also beheld the power of the Lamb of God, that it descended upon the saints of the Church of the Lamb and upon the covenant people of the Lord. And they were armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. The phrase armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory is not simply a nice idea or an example of beautiful scriptural language. Rather, these blessings are readily evident in the lives of countless Latter-day Disciples of the Lord. My assignments as a member of the Twelve take me all over the world, and I have been blessed to meet and learn memorable lessons from many of you. I testify that the covenant people of the Lord today indeed are armed with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. I have witnessed faith, courage, perspective, persistence, and joy that extend far beyond mortal capacity and that only God could provide. I witnessed the righteousness and power of God in great glory, received through faithfulness to covenants and ordinances, in the life of a young church member who was partially paralyzed in a horrific automobile accident. After grueling months of recovery and adapting to a new lifestyle with restricted mobility, I met and talked with this stalwart soul. During our conversation, I asked, what has this experience helped you to learn? The immediate response was, I am not sad. I am not mad, and everything will be okay. I witnessed the righteousness and power of God in great glory, received through faithfulness to covenants and ordinances in the lives of newly baptized and confirmed members of the Church. These converts were eager to learn and serve, willing but often unsure about how to set aside old habits and strong traditions, and yet joyful to become fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. I witnessed the righteousness and power of God in great glory, received through faithfulness to covenants and ordinances, in the lives of a family who cared tenderly for a spouse and parent with a terminal disease. These valiant disciples describe times that their family felt all alone and times they knew the hand of the Lord was lifting and strengthening them. The family expressed sincere gratitude for the difficult mortal experiences 
that allow us to grow and become more like our Heavenly Father and our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. God succored and blessed this family with the companionship of the Holy Ghost and made their home as sacred a place of refuge as the Holy Temple. I witness the righteousness and power of God in great glory received through faithfulness to covenants and ordinances. In the life of a church member who experienced the heartache of divorce, this sister's spiritual and emotional distress was heightened by a sense of unfairness associated with her spouse's violation of covenants and the breakup of their marriage. She wanted justice and accountability. As this faithful woman was struggling with all that had happened to her, she studied and pondered the Savior's atonement more intently and intensely than ever before in her life. Gradually, a deeper understanding of Christ's redemptive mission distilled upon her soul. His suffering for our sins and also for our pains, weakness, disappointments, and anguish. And she was inspired to ask herself a penetrating question. Since the price already has been paid for those sins, would you demand that the price be paid twice? She realized that such a requirement would be neither just nor merciful. This woman learned that binding herself to the Savior through covenants and ordinances can heal the wounds caused by another person's unrighteous exercise of moral agency and enabled her to find the capacity to forgive and receive peace, mercy, and love. Covenant promises and blessings are possible only because of our Savior, Jesus Christ. He invites us to look to Him, come unto Him, learn of Him, and bind ourselves to Him through the covenants and ordinances of His restored gospel. I testify and promise that honoring covenants arms us with righteousness and with the power of God in great glory. And I witness that the living Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior. Of these truths, I joyfully testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Shortly after I was called to serve as a general tour in 70, I had the opportunity to visit with President Russell M. Nelson for a few minutes. It was an unplanned encounter in the cafeteria, and he was so kind to invite Elder S. Mark Palmer and me to sit and enjoy lunch with him. What do we talk about during lunch with the prophet? Was the thought that came to my mind. So I decided to ask President Nelson if he had any counsel and guidance for me since I was just starting my calling. His answer was very simple and direct. He looked at me and said, Elder Shimayo, you are called for what you can become. I walked away from that experience pondering about what the Lord wants me to become. As I thought about this, I realized that He wants me to become a better husband, father and son, and a better servant. I then realized that all of this could be accomplished as I work to become a better disciple of the Savior Jesus Christ. Last General Conference, President Nelson said, to do anything well requires effort. Becoming a true disciple of Jesus Christ is no exception. President Nelson is inviting us to work hard to become a better disciple of Jesus Christ. He told us that to become more like the Savior, we need to strengthen our faith by asking, acting, and studying, among other things. He said, and I quote, Ask your Heavenly Father in the name of Jesus Christ for help. Asking through prayer is one of the keys to know how to become a better disciple of Jesus Christ. Towards the end of His ministry among the Nephites in the Americas, Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. Later, His disciples gathered together. 
united in mighty prayer and fasting. And Jesus showed himself unto them, for they were praying unto the Father in his name. Why did Jesus show himself again to his disciples? Because they were praying, they were asking. Then he continued, Now I go into the Father, and verily I say unto you, Whatsoever things ye shall ask the Father in my name shall be given unto you. Therefore, ask, and ye shall receive. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For he that asketh receiveth, and unto him that knocketh it shall be opened. We need to ask in faith, to know the will of the Lord, and accept that the Lord knows what is better for us. Acting is another essential key to becoming a better disciple of Jesus Christ. As we act, He will guide and direct us along the way. I am sure that Nephi was seeking guidance from the Lord to know how to get the breastplate from Laban. Yet, he and his brothers tried twice without success, but they were acting, and the Lord was directing them along the way. Finally, Nephi was successful the third time. He recalled, I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. This is how the Lord works as we put forth effort and act, even when we do not have a clear understanding of what needs to be done. The Lord told Nephi what to do, go and get the plates. But he did not tell Nephi how to do it. He left it to Nephi to figure out and seek the Lord's help. And this is often how the Lord works in our lives. As we act in faith, the Lord guides and directs us. In 3 Nephi, the disciples mentioned to the Savior that there were disputations among the people regarding the name of the church. In response, the Savior taught an important principle when he asked, have they not read the scriptures? Studying is then another essential key to become a better disciple of Jesus Christ. Prayer and scripture study go hand in hand. They work together for our benefit. This is the process that the Lord has established. Feast upon the words of Christ, for behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things what he should do. The Savior also taught that we should not only study the scriptures, but also teach from them, as he demonstrated to the Nephites. And now it came to pass that when Jesus had expounded all the scriptures in one, which they had written, he commanded them that they should teach the things which he had expounded into them. This is one of the reasons why it was so important for Nephi to go back and get the breastplates. His family needed the scriptures, not only to help them journey to the promised land, but also to help them teach their children. We too must seek guidance from the scriptures for our journey, and we must teach from them in our homes and church callings. Many times, answers to prayers will not come right away, but we must have faith to continue acting righteousness and be persistent like Nephi when he was trying to get the breastplates. The Lord will show us a little bit at a time. As we study the scriptures, the Lord will give us the answers or the necessary strength to, for us to get through one more day, one more week, and try one more time. Elder Richard G. Scott said, Be thankful that sometimes God lets you struggle for a long time before answers come. That causes your faith to increase and your character to grow. Through prayer and scripture studying, the Lord has always given me the strength to act and endure one more day, one more week, and try one more time. Many times the answers did not come right away. I have questions that have not been answered yet, but I keep asking and studying, and I'm happy that the Lord continues to give me the strength to act as I wait for answers. Elder Richard Scott also said, as you walk to the boundary of your understanding into the twilight of uncertainty, exercising faith, you will be led to find solutions you would not obtain otherwise. To become a better follower of the Savior Jesus Christ is a lifelong journey, and we are all in different stages, moving at a different pace. 
we must keep in mind that this is not a competition and we are here to love and help each other. We need to be acting in order to allow the Savior to work with us in our lives. Speaking to Signe Rigdon, the Lord said the following, I have looked upon thee and thy works. I have heard thy prayers and prepared thee for a greater work. I testify that the Lord hears and answers our prayers. He knows us. He has a great work for each one of us. Through prayer, scripture study and action, we can unlock the blessings of heaven and become a better follower of the Savior Jesus Christ. President Dallin H. Oaks taught that the final judgment is not just an evaluation of a sum total of good and evil acts, what we have done. It is an acknowledgement of the final effect of our acts and thoughts, what we have become. I am grateful for prophets, seers, and revelators. They are the watchmen on the tower. They see things that we do not see. I testify that through their words, we can become better followers of the Savior Jesus Christ and achieve our potential. I testify that Christ lives and knows each one of us individually. This is His church. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. Brothers and sisters, do you know how completely God, our Heavenly Father, loves you? Have you felt His love deep in your soul? When you know and understand how completely you are loved as a child of God, it changes everything. It changes the way you feel about yourself when you make mistakes. It changes how you feel when difficult things happen. It changes your view of God's commandments. It changes your view of others and of your capacity to make a difference. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland taught, the first great commandment of all eternity is to love God with all of our heart, might, mind, and strength. That's the first great commandment. But the first great truth of all eternity is that God loves us with all of His heart, might, mind, and strength. How can each of us know deep in our souls that great truth of eternity? The prophet Nephi was shown in vision the most powerful evidence of God's love. Upon viewing the tree of life, Nephi asked to know the interpretation thereof. In answer, an angel showed Nephi a city, a mother, and a baby. As Nephi looked upon the city of Nazareth and the righteous Mother Mary holding the infant Jesus in her arms, the angel declared, Behold, the Lamb of God, yea, even the Son of the Eternal Father. At that sacred moment, Nephi understood that in the birth of the Savior, God was showing forth His pure and complete love. God's love, Nephi testified, sheddeth itself abroad in the hearts of the children of men. We can picture the love of God as light emanating from the tree of life, shedding itself abroad over all the earth into the hearts of the children of men. God's light and love permeate all His creations. Sometimes we mistakenly think that we can only feel God's love after we have followed the iron rod and partaken of the fruit. <clears throat> God's love, however, is not only received by those who come to the tree, but is the very power that motivates us to seek that tree. Wherefore, it is the most desirable above all things Nephi taught and the angel exclaimed, Yea, and the most joyous to the soul. Twenty years ago, a beloved family member stepped away from the church. He had many unanswered questions. 
His wife, a convert, stayed true to her faith. They worked hard to preserve their marriage in the differences that arose. Last year, he wrote down three questions about the church that were difficult for him to reconcile and sent them to two couples who had been his friends for several years. He invited them to reflect on those questions and come to dinner to share their thoughts. Following this visit with friends, he went to his room and started working on a project. The evening conversation and the love shown to him by his friends came to the forefront of his mind. He later wrote that he was compelled to stop his work. He said, a bright light filled my soul. I was familiar with this deep feeling of enlightenment, but in this case, it continued to grow stronger than ever before and lasted for several minutes. I sat quietly with the feeling which I came to understand as a manifestation of the love of God for me. I felt a spiritual impression that told me I could return to church and express this love of God in what I do there. He then wondered about his questions. The feeling he received was that God honored his questions and that not having clear answers should not stop him from moving forward. He should share God's love with all while he continued to contemplate. As he acted on that impression, he felt a kinship with Joseph Smith, who remarked after his first vision, my soul was filled with love, and for many days I could rejoice with great joy. Remarkably, a few short months later, he received the same calling he had held 20 years before. The first time he held the calling, he performed his responsibilities as a dutiful member of the church. Now the question for him became not, how can I fulfill this calling, but how can I show God's love through my service? With this new approach, he felt joy, meaning, and purpose in all aspects of his calling. Sisters and brothers, how can we receive the transforming power of God's love? The prophet Mormon invites us to pray unto the Father with all the energy of heart that ye may be filled with this love which he hath bestowed upon all who are true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ. Mormon is not only inviting us to pray that we may be filled with his love for others, but to pray that we may know of God's pure love for ourselves. As we receive his love, we find greater joy in striving to love and serve as he did, becoming true followers of his Son, Jesus Christ. God's love is not found in the circumstances of our lives, but in his presence in our lives. We know of his love when we receive strength beyond our own and when his spirit brings peace, comfort, and direction. At times, it may be difficult to feel his love, we can pray to have our eyes opened to see his hand in our lives and to see his love in the beauty of his creations. As we ponder the Savior's life and his infinite sacrifice, we begin to understand his love for us. We reverently sing the words of Eliza R. Snow, his precious blood he freely spilt, his life he freely gave. Jesus' humility and suffering for us distills upon our souls, opening our hearts to seek forgiveness at his hand and filling us with a desire to live as he did. President Nelson wrote, the more committed we become to patterning our lives after his, 
the purer and more divine our love becomes. Our son related. When I was 11, my friends and I decided to hide from our teacher and skip the first half of our primary class. When we finally arrived, to our surprise, the teacher greeted us warmly. He then offered a heartfelt prayer during which he expressed sincere gratitude to the Lord that we had decided to come to class that day of our own free will. I cannot remember what the lesson was about or even our teacher's name, but now, some 30 years later, I am still touched by the pure love he showed me that day. Five years ago, I observed an example of divine love while attending primary in Russia. I saw a faithful sister kneel in front of two children and testify to them that even if they were the only ones living on earth, Jesus would have suffered and died just for them. I testify that our Lord and Savior did indeed die for each and every one of us. It was an expression of his infinite love for us and for his Father. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives to bless us with his love. May we open our hearts to receive the pure love that God has for us and then shed forth his love in all we do and are. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Even though our family has enjoyed rich blessings while joyfully walking the covenant path, we have also faced exceedingly high mountains. I wish to share some very personal experiences regarding mental illness. These include clinical depression, severe anxiety, bipolar disorder, ADHD, and sometimes a combination of them all. I share these tender experiences with the approval of those involved. During my ministry, I have encountered hundreds of individuals and families with similar experiences. Sometimes I wonder if the desolating sickness covering the land, as mentioned in the scriptures, might include mental illness. It is worldwide, covering every continent and culture, and affecting all, young, old, rich, and poor. Members of the church have not been excluded. At the same time, our doctrine teaches us to strive to become like Jesus Christ and be perfected in Him. Our children sing, I'm trying to be like Jesus. We long to be perfect, even as our Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are perfect. Because mental illness can interfere with our perception of perfection, it remains all too often a taboo. As a result, there is too much ignorance, too much silent suffering, and too much despair. Many feeling overwhelmed because they do not meet perceived standard mistakenly believe they have no place in the church. To combat such deception, it is important to remember that the Savior loves each of his Father's children. He fully comprehends the pain and struggle that many experience as they live with a broad range of mental health challenges. He suffered pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, taking upon him the pains and the sickness of his people. Because he understands all afflictions, he knows how to heal the brokenhearted. Challenges often indicate a need for additional tools and support and are not a character defect. Allow me to share several observations I made as our family has passed through trials. First, many people will mourn with us. They won't judge us. Due to severe panic attacks, anxiety, and depression, our son returned home from his mission just after four weeks. As his parents, we found it difficult to deal with disappointment and sadness because we had prayed so much for his success. Like all parents, we want our children to prosper and be happy. A mission was to be an important milestone for our son. We also wondered what other people might think. Unbeknownst to us, our son's return was infinitely more devastating for him. Note that he loved the Lord and wanted to serve, and yet he could not for reasons he struggled to understand. 
He soon found himself at a point of total hopelessness, battling deep guilt. He no longer felt accepted, but spiritually numb. He became consumed by recurring thoughts of death. While in this irrational state, our son believed that the only action left was to take his own life. It took the Holy Ghost and a legion of angels on both sides of the veil to save him. While he was fighting for his life, and during this immensely difficult time, our family, ward leaders, members, and friends went out of their way to support and minister to us. I have never felt such an outpouring of love. I have never sensed more powerfully and in such a personal way what it means to comfort those in need of comfort. Our family will be ever grateful for that outpouring. I cannot describe the countless miracles that accompanied these events. Gratefully, our son survived, but it has taken a long time and much medical, therapeutic and spiritual care for him to heal and to accept that he is loved, valued and needed. I recognize that not all such incidents like or end like ours. I sorrow with those who have lost loved ones far too early and are now left with feelings of grief as well as unanswered questions. My next observation is that it can be difficult for parents to identify their children's struggles. But we must educate ourselves. How can we know the difference between the difficulties associated with normal development and signs of illness? As parents, we have the sacred charge to help our children navigate life's challenges. However, few of us are mental health specialists. We nevertheless need to care for our children by helping them learn to be content with their sincere efforts as they strive to meet appropriate expectations. Each of us knows from our own personal shortcomings that spiritual growth is an ongoing process. We now understand that there is not a simple cure-all for emotional and mental wellness. We will experience stress and turmoil because we live in a fallen world with a fallen body. Additionally, many contributing factors may lead to a diagnosis of mental illness. Regardless of our mental and emotional well-being, focusing on growth is healthier than obsessing about our shortcomings. For my wife and me, the one thing that has always helped us was staying as close to the Lord as possible. In hindsight, we now see how the Lord patiently tutored us through times of great uncertainty. His light guided us step by step to the darkest hours. The Lord helped us to see what, that the worth of an individual soul is far more important in the eternal scheme than any earthly task or achievement. Again. Educating ourselves about mental illness prepares us to help ourselves and others who might be struggling. Open and honest discussion with one another will help this important topic to receive the attention it deserves. After all, information precedes inspiration and revelation. These all too often invisible challenges can affect anyone, and when we are facing them, they appear insurmountable. One of the first things we need to learn is that we are certainly not alone. I invite you to study the topic of mental health in the Life Help section of the Gospel Library app. Learning will lead to more understanding, more acceptance, more compassion, more love. It can lessen tragedy while helping us develop and manage healthy expectations and healthy interactions. My final observation, we need to constantly watch over each other. We must love one another and be less judgmental, especially when our expectations are not immediately met. We should help our children and youth feel the love of Jesus Christ in their lives, even when they struggle to personally feel love for themselves. Elder Orson F. Whitney, who served as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, counseled parents how to help struggling offspring. Pray for your children. Hold on to them with your faith. I have often pondered what it means to hold on to them with faith. I believe it includes simple acts of love, meekness, kindness, and respect. It means allowing them to develop at their own pace, bearing testimony to help them feel our Savior's love. It requires us to think more about them and less about ourselves or others. That usually means speaking less and listening much, much more. We must love them, empower them, and praise them often in their efforts to succeed and be faithful to God. And finally, 
we should do everything in our power to stay close to them, just as we stay close to God. For all who are personally affected by mental illness, hold fast to your covenants, even if you might not feel God's love at this time. Do whatever lies in your power and then stand still to see the salvation of God for his arm to be revealed. I testify that Jesus Christ is our Savior. He knows us, he loves us, and he will wait on us. During our family trials, I have come to know just how close he is. His promises are true. Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed. For I am thy God, and I will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. Knowing how firm our foundation is, may we ever joyfully declare, the soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I cannot desert to his foes. That soul through all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no never, no never forsake. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The congregation will now join the choir in singing Redeemer of Israel. After the singing, we will hear from Elder Ronald A. Rasband of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Elders Christoffel Golden and Moses Villanueva of the Seventy, whose messages were also pre-recorded from their assigned areas. This is the Saturday afternoon session of the 191st Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
My brothers and sisters, as I stand in our beloved conference center once again, I am reminded of the words of the Apostle Peter, Lord, it is good for us to be here. My thoughts today are centered on the words of the prophet Nephi, who kept the record of his people following Father Lehi's death. Nephi wrote, And upon these I write the things of my soul. I used to pass over this verse, thinking the word things was not very elegant or spiritual, not grand enough to pair with my soul. Yet I have learned that the word things is used in the scriptures 2,354 times. For example, in Moses, I am the beginning and the end, the Almighty God, mine only begotten, I created these things. And Nephi's words, Behold, my soul delighteth in the things of the Lord, and my heart pondereth continually upon the things which I have seen and heard. Nephi's words raise the questions, What things do you ponder? What things really matter to you? What are the things of your soul? The things of our souls are often clarified and deepened by asking questions. During the pandemic, I have met with youth from all over the world in many devotionals, large and small, through broadcasts and social media, and we discussed their questions. Fourteen-year-old Joseph Smith had a question deep in his soul, and he took it to the Lord. President Russell M. Nelson has emphasized, take your questions to the Lord and to other faithful sources. Study with the desire to believe rather than with the hope that you can find a flaw in the fabric of a prophet's life or a discrepancy in the scriptures. Stop increasing your doubts by rehearsing them with doubters. Allow the Lord to lead you on your journey of spiritual discovery. Youth often ask me what I believe and why I believe. I remember visiting virtually with one young woman in her home. I asked if it was the first time an apostle had been in her home. She quickly smiled and responded, yes. Her question for me was good. What are the most important things I should know? I answered with the things of my soul, the things that prepare me to hear promptings, that lift my sights beyond the ways of the world, that give purpose to my work in the gospel and to my very life. May I share with you some of the things of my soul? These things apply to all who seek to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. Ten would be a good round number. Today I am giving you seven with the hope that you will complete eight, nine, and ten from your own experiences. First, Love God the Father and Jesus Christ, our Savior. Jesus decreed the first great commandment, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. President Nelson declared his devotion to God, our Eternal Father, and to his Son, Jesus Christ, when he was called to lead the Lord's Church, saying, quote, I know them, love them, and pledge to serve them and you with every remaining breath of my life." End quote. So first, love the Father and the Son. Second, love thy neighbor. That is not just a good idea. It's the second great commandment. Your neighbors are your spouse and family, ward members, work colleagues, roommates, those not of our faith, those needing a helping hand, and frankly, Everyone. The essence of love thy neighbor is voiced in the hymn, Love One Another. President Nelson reminds us, when we love God with all our hearts, He turns our hearts to the well-being of others. Third, love yourself. This is where many struggle. Isn't it curious that loving ourselves seems to come less easily than loving others? Yet the Lord has said, Love thy neighbor as thyself. 
He values the divinity within us, and so must we. When we are heavy laden with mistakes, heartaches, feelings of inadequacy, disappointment, anger, or sin, the power of the Savior's Atonement is by divine design one of the things that lifts the soul. Fourth, keep the commandments. The Lord has made it clear, if ye love me, keep my commandments. Strive each day to be and do a little better and to press forward in righteousness. Fifth, always be worthy to attend the temple. I call it being recommended to the Lord. Whether you have access to a temple or not, being worthy of a current temple recommend keeps you firmly focused on the things that matter, the covenant path. Sixth, be joyful and cheerful. Be of good cheer and do not fear, the Lord has said. Why? How? When challenges face, it, face us at every turn? Because of the promise made by Jesus Christ, I, the Lord, am with you and will stand by you. President Nelson describes the restored gospel as a message of joy, and he explains, the Lord, excuse me, the Lord we feel with joy we have, has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. Seventh, follow God's living prophet. This may be seventh on my list of things, but it is at the top of my mind in terms of its importance today. We have a prophet of God on the earth today. Never discount what that means for you. Remember the young woman I mentioned at the beginning? She wanted to know what things mattered most. Follow the living prophet, I said then, and I emphasize again today. We are distinguished as a church to be led by prophets, seers, and revelators called of God for this time. I promise that as you listen and follow their counsel, you will never be led astray. Never. We live in a time when we are tossed to and fro, when spirituality, decency, integrity, and respect are under attack. We have to make choices. We have the voice of the Lord through His prophet to calm our fears and lift our sights. For when President Nelson speaks, he speaks for the Lord. We are blessed with scriptures and teachings that remind us, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. So it was with Naaman, a great military leader in Syria, yet a leper, who was told that the prophet Elisha could heal him. Elisha sent his messenger to tell Naaman to wash in the river Jordan seven times and he would be clean. Naaman scoffed. Certainly there was a mightier river than the Jordan. And why send a servant when he expected Elisha the prophet to personally heal him? Naaman walked away, but eventually was persuaded by his servants. If the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? Naaman finally dipped seven times in the Jordan and was healed. The account of Naaman reminds us of the risk of picking and choosing the parts of prophetic counsel that fit our thinking, expectation, or today's norms. Our prophet continually points us to our own river Jordans to be healed. The most important words we can hear, ponder, and follow are those revealed through our living prophet. I bear witness that I have sat in council with President Nelson to discuss weighty matters of the Church and of the world, and I have seen revelation throw, flow through him. He knows the Lord. He knows His ways, and He desires that all of God's children will hear Him the Lord Jesus Christ. For many years, we heard from the prophet twice a year at general conference. But with the complex issues of our day, President Nelson is speaking much more often in forums, social media, devotionals, and even press briefings. I have observed him preparing and pre presenting 
profound revelatory messages that have encouraged more gratitude, promoted greater inclusion of all our brothers and sisters on earth, and increased peace, hope, joy, help, and healing in our individual lives. President Nelson is a gifted communicator, but more importantly, he is a prophet of God. That is staggering when you think about it, but it is critical to realize that his clear direction will shield us from all the deceit, craftiness, and secular ways gaining momentum in the world today. The prophetic mantle is all about revelation. The restoration of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a bicentennial proclamation to the world given in the April 2020 General Conference, emphasizes that the Lord is directing this work. In this proclamation, the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles state, quote, We gladly declare that the promised restoration goes forward through continuing revelation. The earth will never again be the same, as God will gather together in one all things in Christ. All things in Christ and the things of my soul are what this church, this gospel, and this people are all about. I close with an invitation for each of you to consider the seven things of my soul I have shared today. Love God the Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. Love your neighbor. Love yourself. Keep the commandments. Always be worthy of a temple recommend. Be joyful and cheerful and follow God's living prophet. I, ident I invite you to identify your own 8, 9, and 10. Consider ways you might share your heartfelt things with others and encourage them to pray, ponder, and seek the Lord's guidance. The things of my soul are as precious to me as yours are to you. These things strengthen our service in the Church and in all areas of life. They commit us to Jesus Christ. They remind us of our covenants, and they help us feel secure, secure in the arms of the Lord. I testify that He desires that our souls shall never hunger nor thirst, but shall be filled with His love as we seek to become His true disciples, to be one with Him as He is with the Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. As recorded in the Book of Mormon, six years before the birth of Jesus Christ, Samuel, a righteous Lamanite, prophesied to Nephite people who by then had become mostly apostate of the signs that would accompany our Savior's birth. Tragically, most Nephites rejected those signs because it was not reasonable that such a being as a Christ should come. Regrettably, according to the scriptural record, many of the Jews, in like manner, could not accept that a man named Jesus from the little regarded province of Galilee was the long-awaited Messiah. Jesus, who had indeed come to fulfill the many prophecies made by Hebrew prophets, was rejected and even crucified because, as the Book of Mormon prophet Jacob taught, the Jews were looking beyond the mark. Consequently, Jacob prophesied that God hath taken away his plainness from them and delivered unto them many things which they cannot understand because they desired it. And because they desired it, God had done it that they may stumble. Strange as it may seem, no teaching, no miracle, and no appearance even of a heavenly angel as witnessed by Laman and Lemuel, appears to have the persuasive power to convince some individuals to alter their course, outlook, or belief that something is true. This is especially the case when teachings or miracles do not agree with an individual's preconceived whims, wishes, or ideas. Please contrast for a moment the following two scriptures. The first from the Apostle Paul, speaking of the latter days, describing the ways of man. And the second from Alma the prophet, 
showing how God does his work among mankind. First from Paul. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despises all those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And now from Alma stating a foundational principle of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now ye may suppose that this is foolishness in me, but behold, I say unto you, that by small and simple things are great things brought to pass. And small means in many instances doth confound the wise. We live in a modern world filled with great knowledge and much prowess. Nonetheless, these things too often camouflage the unsteady foundation upon which they are built. Consequently, they do not lead to real truth and on toward God and the power to receive revelation, acquire spiritual knowledge, and develop faith in Jesus Christ that leads to salvation. We are profoundly reminded of our Lord's words to Thomas and the other apostles on the eve of his atoning sacrifice. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. For those who have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to feel more than ever before, we require to confront the reality that we are getting ever closer to the second coming of Jesus Christ. True, great difficulties yet await those on the earth at his return. But in this regard, the faithful need not fear. Now I quote for a moment from the church's gospel topics under the heading, The Second Coming of Jesus Christ. When the Savior comes again, he will come in power and glory to claim the earth is his kingdom. His second coming will mark the beginning of the millennium. The second coming will be a fearful, mournful time for the wicked, but it will be a day of peace for the righteous. The Lord declared, they that are wise and have received the truth and have taken the Holy Spirit for their guide and have not been deceived. Verily I say unto you, they shall not be hewn down and cast into the fire, but shall abide the day. And the earth shall be given unto them for an inheritance and they shall multiply and wax strong and their children shall grow up without sin unto salvation. For the Lord shall be in their midst and his glory shall be upon them, and he will be their king and their lawgiver. In our preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ, I provide a vital comforting note for the faithful taken from the Old Testament prophet Amos. Surely the Lord God will do nothing until he revealeth his secret unto his servants the prophets. In this spirit, Today's prophet of the Lord to the world, President Russell M. Nelson, has given us this recent inspiring counsel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of repentance. Because of the Savior's atonement, his gospel provides an invitation to keep changing, growing, and becoming more pure. It is a gospel of hope, of healing, and of progress. Thus, the gospel is a message of joy. Our spirits rejoice with every small step forward we take. I unreservedly testify of and attest to the reality of God and the miracles in everyday life, of countless people from both the low and high stations of life. True, many sacred experiences are rarely spoken of, in part because of their divine origin and the resulting possibility of ridicule by some who do not know better. 
In this regard, the last of the Book of Mormon prophets, Moroni, reminds us. And again, I speak unto you who deny the revelations of God and say that they are done away, that they are no revelations, no prophecies, no gifts, no healing, no speaking with tongues and the interpretation of tongues. Behold, I say unto you, he that denieth these things knoweth not the gospel of Christ. Yea, he has not read the Scriptures. If so, he does not understand them. For do we not read that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? And in Him there is no variableness, neither shadow of changing? I conclude my remarks with a truly inspiring prophetic declaration from the prophet Joseph Smith given near the end of his ministry as he looked forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Shall we not go on in so great a cause? Go forward and not backward. Courage, brethren, and may I add, sisters, and on, on to the victory. Let your hearts rejoice and be exceedingly glad, to which I add my witness in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The COVID-19 pandemic has been one of the many trials and challenges that God's children have confronted throughout the history of the world. At the beginning of this year, my beloved family and I lived through some dark days. The pandemic and other causes brought death and pain to our family through the passing of some dear loved ones. Despite medical attention, fasting and prayer, during the course of five weeks, my brother, my sister, and my brother-in-law crossed to the other side of the veil. At times I have wondered why the Savior cried when he saw Mary anguished by the death of her brother Lazarus, knowing that he had the power to raise Lazarus and that very soon the Savior would use this power to rescue his friend from death. I am amazed by the Savior's compassion and empathy for Mary. He understood that indescribable pain that Mary felt at the death of her brother Lazarus. We feel that same intense pain when we experience the temporary separation from our loved ones. The Savior has perfect compassion for us. He doesn't fault us for our short-sightedness, nor for being limited in visualizing our eternal journey. Rather, He has compassion for us, our sadness and suffering. Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, want us to have joy. President Russell M. Nelson has taught that joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. When the focus of our lives is on God's plan of salvation, we can feel joy regardless of what is happening or not happening in our lives. When I was a young missionary, I remember when a marvelous missionary that I had come to admire received some devastating news. His mother and his younger brother had passed away in a tragic accident. The mission president offered this elder the option to return home for the funeral. However, after speaking with his father on the phone, this missionary decided to stay and finish his mission. A short time later, when we were serving in the same zone, my companion and I received an emergency call. Some thieves had stolen the bicycle belonging to this same missionary and had injured him with a knife. He and his companion had to walk to the nearest hospital where my companion and I met up with them. On the way to the hospital, I was grieving for this missionary. I imagined that his spirit would be low and that surely after this traumatic experience, he would now want to return home. However, when we arrived at the hospital, I saw this missionary lying in his bed, waiting to be taken into surgery, and he was smiling. I thought, how could he be smiling at a time like this? 
while he was recuperating in the hospital, he enthusiastically handed out pamphlets and copies of the Book of Mormon to the doctors, nurses, and other patients. Even with these trials, he did not want to go home. Rather, he served until the last day of his mission with faith, energy, strength, and enthusiasm. At the beginning of the Book of Mormon, Nephi states, having seen many afflictions in the course of my days, nevertheless, having been highly favored of the Lord in all my days, I think of the many trials that Nephi experienced, many of which are included in his writing. His trials help us understand that we all have our dark days. One of these trials occurred when Nephi was commanded to return to Jerusalem to obtain the brass plates that Laban had in his possession. Some of Nephi's brothers were men of little faith, and they even beat Nephi with a stick. Nephi experienced another trial when he broke his bow and could not obtain food for his family. Later, when he was commanded to build a ship, his brothers mocked him and refused to help him. Despite this and many other trials during the course of his life, Nephi always recognized the goodness of God. As his family was crossing the ocean on the way to the promised land, some of Nephi's family began to make themselves merry, speak harshly, and forget that it was the Lord's power that had preserved them. When Nephi chastised them, they became offended and bound him with cords so that he was unable to move. The Book of Mormon states that his brethren did treat him with much harshness. His wrists and ankles were much swollen and great was the soreness. Nephi was grieved with the hardness of his brother's hearts, and at times fell overcome with sorrow. Nevertheless, he declared, I did look unto my God, and I did praise him all day long, and I did not murmur against the Lord because of my afflictions. My dear brothers and sisters, how do we react to our afflictions? Do we murmur before the Lord because of them? Or like Nephi and my former missionary friend, do we feel thankful in word, thought, and deed because we are more focused on our blessings than our problems? Our, our Savior Jesus Christ gave us the example during his early ministry in moments of difficulty and trial. There are few things that bring us greater peace and satisfaction than serving our fellow man. The book of Matthew recounts what happened when the Savior learned that his cousin John the Baptist had been beheaded by King Herod to please the daughter of Herodias. And his disciples came and took up the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. When Jesus heard of it, he departed thence by ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the cities and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion toward them, and he healed their sick. And when it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a desert place, and the time is now past. Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart. Give ye them to eat. Jesus Christ showed us that during times of trial and adversity, we can recognize the difficulties of others, moved with compassion. We can reach out and lift them. And as we do so, we are also lifted by our Christ-like service. President Gordon B. Hinckley stated, the best antidote I know for worry is work. The best medicine for despair is service. The best cure for weariness is the challenge of helping someone who is even more tired. In this, the Church of Jesus Christ, I have had many opportunities to minister and serve my fellow men. It is at those times when I feel that Heavenly Father lightens my burdens. President Russell M. Nelson is the prophet of God on earth. He is a great example 
of how we should minister to others during difficult trials. I unite my testimony with those of many other saints that God is our loving Heavenly Father. I have felt his infinite love during my dark days. Our Savior Jesus Christ understands our pains and our afflictions. He wants to ease our burdens and come for us. We must follow his example by serving and minister to those with even greater burdens than our own. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We are grateful to all who have spoken to us this afternoon and for the beautiful music that has been provided. We remind you of the Saturday evening general session, which will commence in the conference center this evening at 6 p.m. Mountain Daylight Time. Our concluding speaker for this session will be Elder Gary E. Stevenson, of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, This is the Christ. The benediction will then be offered by Sister Rebecca L. Craven, second counselor in the Young Women General Presidency. I also offer a warm welcome to each of you participating in this conference. Today I hope to describe two elements of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ, followed by four stirring accounts from Latter-day Saints around the world, demonstrating the application of these principles. The first element of the restored gospel, God's work of salvation and exaltation, focuses on divinely appointed responsibilities. The second element reminds us that the gospel is plain, precious, and simple. <clears throat> to receive eternal life, we must come unto Christ and be perfected in Him. As we come unto Christ and help others do the same, we participate in God's work of salvation and exaltation, which focuses on divinely appointed responsibilities. These divine responsibilities align with the priesthood keys restored by Moses, Elias, Elijah, recorded in the 110th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, and the second great commandment given to us by Jesus Christ, to love our neighbors as ourselves. They are found on the first two pages of the updated General Handbook, available to all members. If hearing the words General Handbook or divinely appointed responsibilities causes you to shudder in fear of complexity, please don't. These responsibilities are simple, inspirational, motivating, and doable. Here they are. First, living the gospel of Jesus Christ. Next, caring for those in need. Third, inviting all to receive the gospel and fourth, uniting families for eternity. You might view them as I do, as a roadmap to return back to our loving Heavenly Father. <clears throat> it has been said that the gospel of Jesus Christ is simply beautiful and beautifully simple. The world is not. It is complicated, complex, and filled with turmoil and strife. We are blessed as we exercise care not to allow the complexity so common in the world to enter into the way we receive and practice the gospel. President Dallin H. Oaks observed, We are taught many small and simple things in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need to be reminded that in total and over a significant period of time, those seemingly small things bring to pass great things. Jesus Christ himself describes that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We should all strive to keep the gospel simple in our lives 
in our families, in our classes and quorums, and in our wards and stakes. As you listen to the following stories that I'll share with you now, recognize they've been carefully chosen to inspire on the one hand and to inform on the other. The actions of each of these Latter-day Saints becomes a model for each of us, applying the gospel in plain, precious, simple ways while fulfilling one of the divinely appointed responsibilities just introduced. First, living the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jens of Denmark prays daily to live the gospel and notice promptings of, from the Holy Ghost. He has learned to act quickly when he feels directed by the Spirit. Jens shared the following quote, we live in an, an idyllic, small, half-timbered house with a thatched roof in the center of a cozy little village close to the village pond. On this night, with the most beautiful Danish summer weather imaginable, doors and windows were open and everything breathed peace and quiet. Due to our gloriously bright and long summer nights, I had not been in a hurry to replace a burned-out light bulb in our utility room. Suddenly, I got a strong feeling that I had to replace it immediately. At the same time, I heard my wife, Mary Ann, call for me and the children to wash our hands because dinner was ready. I'd been married long enough to know that this was not the time to start doing anything else than washing my hands. But I heard myself calling out to Mary Ann that I would just pop over to the store and buy a new light bulb. I felt a strong urge to leave immediately. The grocery store was only on the other side of the pond. We usually walked, but today I grabbed my bike. While riding past the pond out of the corner of my eye, I noticed a small boy about two years old walking alone near the edge of the pond, very close to the water. Suddenly he fell in. One minute he was there, and the next he was gone. No one, had seen, no one had seen this happen but me. I threw my bike on the ground, ran, and jumped into the waist-high pond. The surface of the water immediately closed with duckweed, making it impossible to see through the water. Then I sensed movement to one side. I put my arm in the water, got a, got a hold of a T-shirt, and pulled the little boy up. He started gasping, coughing, and crying. Soon afterward, the boy was reunited with his parents." Close quote. As Brother Jens prays each morning for help to recognize promptings from the Holy Ghost, even something as unusual as to immediately change a light bulb, he also prays that he can, he can be used as a tool to bless God's children. Jens lives the gospel by seeking divine direction each day, striving to be worthy, then doing his best to follow that direction when it comes. Here is an example of caring for those in need. One day, a stake president in the Cucuta Stake in Colombia accompanied the stake young women president to visit two young women and their older teenage brother who were going through some terrible struggles. Recently, their father had passed away, and their mother had passed away a year before. The three siblings were now left all alone in their small, humble shelter. The walls were made of crude wood lined with plastic bags, and the corrugated tin roof covered only the area where they slept. Following their visit, the leaders knew that they needed to help. Through the ward council, a plan to help them began to emerge. Warden stake leaders, Relief Society, Elders Quorum, Young men, young women, and many families all set themselves to the task of blessing this family. The ward organizations contacted several ward members who work in construction. Some helped with design. Others donated time and labor. Others made meals, and still others donated needed materials. When the little house was finished, it was a joyful day for those who helped and for the three young ward members. These orphan children felt warm and reassuring bonds of their ward family to know that they are not alone and that God is always there for them. Those who reached out felt the love of the Savior for this family 
and acted as his hands in serving them. I think you'll enjoy this example of inviting all to receive the gospel. 17-year-old Clayton of Cape Verde had no idea what would happen as a result of walking into his ward seminary class one day, but his life and the lives of others would be forever changed because he did. Clayton, along with his mother and older brother, had been baptized into the church sometime earlier, and yet the family stopped attending. His single act of attending seminary would prove to be a hinge point for the family. The other youth in the seminary class were warm and welcoming. They made Clayton feel at home and encouraged him to attend another activity. He did so and soon began attending his other church meetings. A wise bishop saw his potential and invited him to be his assistant. From that moment on, says Bishop Pina, Clayton became an example and an influence to other young people. The first person Clayton invited to, back to church was his mother, then his older brother. He then widened his circle to friends. One of these friends was a young man his own age, Wilson. Upon his very first meeting with the missionaries, Wilson expressed his desire to be baptized. The missionaries were impressed and amazed at how much Clayton had already shared with, Wil with Wilson. Clayton's efforts didn't stop there. He helped other less active members return in addition to sharing the gospel with friends of other faiths. Today, the ward has 35 active youth with a thriving seminary program, thanks in large part to Clayton's efforts to love, share, and invite. Clayton, along with his older brother, Claiber, are both preparing to serve full-time missions. Finally, let me share a beautiful example of uniting families for eternity. Lydia from Kharkiv, Ukraine, first learned about the temple from the missionaries. Immediately, Lydia felt a fervent desire to attend the temple, and after her baptism, she began preparation to receive a temple recommend. Lydia attended the Freiburg, Germany temple to receive her, her endowment and then spent several days doing proxy work there. Following the dedication of the Kiev, Ukraine temple, Lydia attended the temple more frequently. She and her husband, Anatoly, were eternally sealed there and later called to serve as temple missionaries. Together, they have found more than 15,000 names of ancestors and have provided temple ordinances for them. When asked about her feelings regarding temple work, Lydia says, What did I receive in the temple? I have made new covenants with God. My testimony has been strengthened. I have learned to receive personal revelation. I am able to perform saving ordinances for my deceased ancestors, and I can love and serve other people. She concluded with this very true statement, The Lord wants to see us in the temple often. I'm inspired by the goodness of these Latter-day Saints, each with diverse backgrounds and, and uh, varied in their lives, centered in these four stories. Much can be learned from miraculous outcomes brought through the simple application of simple gospel principles. All they did is within our grasp as well. May we keep the gospel simple as we take upon us our divinely appointed responsibilities to live the gospel of Jesus Christ so as to be sensitive to the promptings as did Jens in Denmark, to care for those in need as demonstrated by the members of the Cucuta Stake in Colombia in providing shelter to orphaned ward members, to invite all to receive the gospel in the way that Clayton from the African country of Cape Verde did with his friends and family. Finally, to unite families for eternity, as exemplified by Lydia from Ukraine through her own temple ordinances, family history efforts, and service in the temple. Doing so will surely bring joy and peace. Of this I promise and testify, and of Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Redeemer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we have the conclusion of this session. Thank thee for the miraculous means that is provided for us to gather throughout the world to testify that thy Son is the Christ. We ask thee that thou will help us to better live our covenants that we may be bound to thy Son. We know it is through him that we can find true joy and hope and peace and healing. We ask thee that thou will help us to remember him in our daily lives, that we may have his spirit to be with us always. And we ask thee that thou will help us to let his light shine through us as we help prepare the world for the return of thy son and to gather Israel in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the Saturday afternoon session of the 191st Semi-Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Speakers were selected from leaders of the church. Music for this session was provided by a multicultural choir from stakes in Northern Utah. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. <laughs>